Welcome to Warmer Dam Gymnasium. Take a look around. This is the place. This is the place where it all happened. This is the place where magic happened. After 53 years, this old guy is a little worse for wear, but much, much like its namesake, it has strong bones and a big heart, and has witnessed some amazing games in front of packed houses over the years. Close your eyes, and you can still see Jell Stockstead leading the Mariners to our first championship. Close your eyes, and you can still see Jeff Jones driving to the hoop, or the Holt brothers dropping dimes from all over the court. Close your eyes, and you can still see Chris Warmerdam blocking shots and grabbing rebounds like no one else has before or since. Trent Dilfer in the post. Kelly Stratton, Stu and Kevin Walters, Doug Glom, Brian and Johnny McNulty, Mike McElroy, Mark Niff, Matt Walters, and all the others. Too many to name all of them now. Giants of Aptos basketball, and all own their greatness to Bill Warmerdam. My name is Mark Dorfman. I am the somewhat recently retired athletic director here at Aptos. I had the pleasure and honor of working with Bill for many years before he retired. I want to, wait, I want to welcome everyone today and thank you for coming to celebrate Coach Warmerdam. Before we start, I want to thank Principal Peggy Pugh and Athletic Director Travis Fox for arranging this celebration today, and also to Luke Hess for the state-of-the-art sound system. I also want to give heartfelt thanks to Pat and the entire Warmerdam family for sharing their time with us today. I'll be brief. We have many wonderful speakers who want to share stories with you about the life and times of Bill Warmerdam. Many of them legendary, most of them true. <laughs> but, but first, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm thoughtless. Is anybody cold in here? <laughs> I could turn the heat up. Warmer talking. Here's a fact many of you don't probably know. I hired Bill Warmerdam. I hired him to coach basketball at Aptos High School. Yes, don't, don't smirk, it's true. In 1993, I, coached, I hired Bill to coach girls basketball. <laughs> we had a last minute unexpected turnover of coaches and Bill offered to step in. As you might surmise, it was a no-brainer. I think Bill's most difficult interview question was, Please, please, Bill, will you take the job? <laughs> that was typical of Bill. He was always there helping. Thank you, Bill. Here's another interesting fact that many of you don't know. Bill was our first head baseball coach. He was also our third, fifth, and seventh head track coach. And he won a track championship in 1981. Warmer also coached cross country and football. Bill loved coaching, and he genuinely enjoyed our students. And his gracious spirit enabled Aptos High School to finagle them into every coaching opening we had. Let me back up quickly. When I first came to Aptos in 1977, as a JV football coach, Bill was already very successful. He had already won five league championships. I left after two seasons, and when I returned in 1990 as the athletic director, Bill was a legend. 10 league championships, 31 CCS playoff appearances, and almost 400 victories. In 1986, his magical team won the CCS and NorCal championships and earned a berth in the state title game. In over 50 years of Aptos basketball, Bill is the only coach to reach the state championship. Warmer was the original running gun coach. He was Paul Westhead before there was Paul Westhead. He was Doug Moe 
before there was Doug Moe. His team ran up and down the court at a frenetic pace. If you pass more than three times, you call a timeout. His team set CCS and state scoring records, many of which still stand today. Before the advent of the three-point line, he coached six games where the Mariners scored over 100 points. Remarkable. But more importantly, Bill remembered as a warm, funny, and generous man. Sometimes goofy, always gracious. He smiled easily and laughed often. He was also a mentor to a generation of athletes and coaches. He was a mentor to me, and I thank him again. Last week, Jessica Johnson said something to me that made me smile. She said that Warmer and Bobby are together again, and more than likely, planning some shenanigans up in heaven. <laughs> Mariners forever. Thank you. Our first speaker today is Bill and Pat's son, Chris, who was recently inducted into the Aptos High Sports Hall of Fame. Chris Warmerdam. I got my uh, moral support here. This is Jennifer and uh, mother of my kids, uh, Joey, Owen, and Brian. And I want to thank her for recording it. I guess uh, puts it on social media so uh, other people can, uh, you know, see it. So thank you. Of course. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I wrote big this time. Okay, this gym was pretty much my whole life from about age five or six. Uh, I was the ball boy here and would come every practice, uh, watch Mr. Miles, Mr. Kanemoto, and then my dad's uh, practices. And I was kind of like maybe the mascot, just kind of annoying players. And they'd try to get the ball. I said, no, I'm dribbling. And they're like, we're playing, you know? So I don't know how much they really liked me or not. But the sound of this ball, I don't know if anyone's ever been in a gym um, when you're alone and you bounce the ball, it just echoes. And um, it's just like an echo of all the history and the ghost of different games. And uh, it's really neat if you ever get a chance, just being yourself, especially this gym, it's just magical. There's something about it. I think I've been in it maybe four times since uh, I played, but. Uh, Something about it. And then uh, me watching Billy play, my brother. Um, you know, when I was about nine, actually eight, and I could see, I mean, I'm standing right where he, I was sitting right there, and uh, he uh, stole the ball here. Or no, another player stole the ball, went for a dunk right there, and Billy chased him down, and you know, blocked it, and then they, uh, almost got in a fight, and I just remember Billy, he's just crazy. I mean, just good, like, out of, not out of control, but I couldn't figure out why this year, when I saw Coach Boyer's team play, and um, um, I'm blanking on the, the two names, Cameron and Jack. and Jack play, and I just got so into it because I couldn't figure out why I liked those two guys so much, and part is the reason why they're so well coached, whoever hired Boyer is just really did a good job. But they play with just almost crazy intensity. And it reminded me of my brother playing. The other thing I remember is my dad, Kanemoto, and Mr. Miles sitting right there. And I was on the bench right there. And my dad was got pissed off about something. <laughs> Getting on the ref, and the ref said, you say one more thing, you're out of here. My dad, of course, said a couple more things. <laughs> So he walked out right out that door, smiling to the pack house, waving, and probably just wanted to go take a break inside and put his feet up. But uh, I remember that like it was yesterday. Um, before I, what I wanted to start my speech with was I could see my dad going to my mom, oh crap, honey, he's gonna ruin this. Why are you having this guy? 
given the speech, I could see him standing in the back and walking out. So, I want to thank special, everybody here special, but uh, just my family, Susie and Tony, Rome, Barbie, uh, Heidi, Jen, and daughter Patty, all my kids, Joey, Ryan, my tiny kid Owen. Uh, it's just support that we need. Uh, sorry, it's kind of scattered. It's just, but uh, of course, I fixed up my pages here. Okay, and also I'd like to thank the Vanderpools, my other cousins from down south. They, uh, my Aunt Jean and all the cousins are just really, I know, going to be supportive. And uh, my Aunt Barbara, Uncle Jake, Danny, Tammy. Uh, my Uncle Jake doesn't get off the ranch ever. He's a, he's a dairy farmer, kind of like the character on Yellowstone. Uh, I forget his name, but he is just a real, he's a man's man. And to see him off the ranch is kind of blowing me away. Okay, but I'm not going to hijack memories because I know these old, old guys that are going to speak, except for Joey, the pretty boy Joey Smith. But the old guys I know are sitting back there, you know, the Walters, and, you know, if Glom was here and everyone else would be like, damn it, that guy's going to take all the stories. You know, he's a, he's a wannabe warmer. You know, he's not the real deal. So I'm not going to uh, take their stories, but I'll give you a couple, and I'm going to be done soon. Uh, one story I remember was uh, at, I think it was either SoCal or Santa Cruz, and there was a rumor that one guy was going to swallow, swallow our goldfish before the game. And so they were pumped up, and everyone's getting excited. And my dad, I'm like, Dad, are you really going to let him do that? And I was a little, and he's like, I don't, know, yeah, I don't see it, I don't know what happens. You know, what they do, they do. <laughs> so anyway, I thought it was all fake, but right before they went out, I forget who it was, but he got up on top of the bleacher or the lockers had a little bad goldfish and he ate it and the players went this is a true story god i sound like someone else oh. but uh yeah they just pumped it up and they were going crazy and they ended up just coming out on fire and i remember just looking at my dad going you know you let him do that he's like hey you know whatever it takes to get the guys rolling so that's a funny story um but yeah, Billy, my brother, he was just my hero along with my dad. And the two of them, I think, are up there. And they got a starting five now. So between uh, my dad, Billy, Mary Kathy, and Joanne. So like it or not, he's up there. He's going to have to play if they start playing games. So I got a lot more, but I'm going to cut half this because half of it doesn't make sense really. But uh, a non basketball story, and this is true, uh, I was real little. My dad was a night watchman at a camp. I forget which one. I am not probably shouldn't say it because who knows he'll come back and get me. But uh, I couldn't figure out why, he, you know, he never wanted to leave my mom, but he definitely liked the job and he came home happy and go, honey, I'm so hungry when he gets home. But the truth was, I only got to go with him one time, but he would wait. He's like, okay, we gotta go do something, but we gotta wait till three in the morning. I go, what? And he's like, okay, I know all the routines of everybody, what they're gonna do, and we, we just gotta go do something. So we were like walking, you know, in the dark shadows, and all of a sudden I get in the cafeteria with him, and I'm like, oh, I know what he's doing. He's going to the fridge and all the good food. <laughs> so anyway, he opens the door after, you know, watching people's routines. Okay, this guy's gonna walk by 2 30, this guy's beyond it. Walked in, and it was just like the tomb. You know, golden tomb, you open the door, there's cheese, <laughs> ice cream, everything. We went in and just sat there and didn't say anything, but just stuff in our face. And it's just little stories like that. Everybody has a connection to them, everyone here. And uh, it's just really seeing your faces, just really, uh, really important to me. But that's, you know, my dad, my hero, the original warmer, you know, and People called me that, but I knew it wasn't, you know, there's only one warmer, and he's my hero. And, um, I just can't say, you know, too many words, you know, we got in our tiffs, but he was most of the time right. You know, sometimes we'd get annoying, and just because just I knew he was right all the time, that's like, damn. 
So anyway, I'm going to end this because I know there's other speakers, but last thing, and this is uh, no joke, I was going through my dad's stuff, and I got my witness here, Warmer Dam's top 25 basketball players. It was sealed, but I opened it, and I'll tell you, my name definitely doesn't have any stars on it, and mine looks like he tried to erase it. But I'm telling you, whoever wants to maybe get in contact me and, you know, go fund me or whatever they call that. I know there's a lot of stars next to the Holtz and the Gloms and the McNulty's and Walters, so anyway, I got this. Uh, so anyway, there's the proof and I'm the only one that's seen it, so. Anyway, I'm gonna end this, but I just really wanna thank everybody here for being here. Every one of your faces I appreciate. It's like going in a time machine and uh, do it with family from Fresno, the Valley people that we love. It's just amazing and uh, I'll never forget all of you. So, thank you. Okay. but I have a kind of a nice story to tell about when I met Chris. I think we met in 95, 96, around there. And um, I'm from over the hill, so I wasn't familiar with anything that had gone on here when he was in high school. And as soon as I came to his house and met Bill and Pat, the first thing that came out was all the newspaper clippings of when they went to the state finals. Like, that was, he, Bill was so proud. And I didn't really understand the enormity of it, and I do now, but I just remember like that was the first thing he was so proud of, and he just wanted me to know all about that. It was very important to him. And um, Chris was always so humble about his last name. I didn't understand um, what all of this meant until I was brought up to the high school, and I begged to come up here because I found out that there was a gym named after his dad, and I'm like, can we, I'm gonna go see it. So we come up here, and then I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, oh, I really like this guy. If we have kids someday, they're going to school here. And I'm not kidding. And, and it has come true. And um, it's just been amazing to be a part of this family. And I'm honored to have children that I can say they're warmer dams. And I um, love you guys. Yeah. Speaker here uh, is Susie Bianchi, my sister, who I care very much about, her whole family. And it's Susie. Thanks, Chris. You didn't introduce me. <laughs> um, I actually wasn't going to speak because I'm really not a public speaker, but. I just felt this morning my dad spoke to me and said, you can do it, Sue. So I put together a few lines and hopefully I can get through it. I want to start by thanking all of you for coming today. It means so much to my mom, Pat, and all of our family. My dad, Coach Warmer, to many of you, was definitely one of a kind. I think that is why so many were drawn to him. Dad was raised by Bill and Belva Warmerdam on a walnut ranch in Hanford, California, alongside his two younger sisters, Gina Barbara. And actually, Sister Barbie got both their names, so I guess she is the favorite, Barbara Jean. <laughs> Farming was in his blood, but he left that to follow his dream of becoming a teacher and a coach. His passion for that was incredible. I'm so proud of you, Dad. When Dad retired, he was able to devote himself completely to his lifelong passion, and that would be my mom. I love that they had a second half of their life where it was just less hectic. Dad loved my mom with his whole heart. I bet you didn't know he was a poet. <laughs> he wrote mom many sweet love notes, knowing dad as we all do. 
he of course framed them and displayed them for everyone to see. <laughs> Dad also loved gardening. I guess it's true, you can't take the farmer out of you. He grew beautiful flowers, fresh vegetables, and award-winning pumpkins. He was shabby chic before there was such a thing. It was not out of the ordinary to walk in our backyard and find old freezers, hot tubs, and even toilets filled with plants. Dad could tell stories like no other. He would have the grandkids in hysterics with just an expression or a few choice words. We will all miss his larger-than-life presence here on Earth, but I know he will be with each of us in the beautiful memories he left behind. Thank you. I'm going to introduce, introduce Barbie. I'm not sure if she wants to speak or not. Do you want to talk for her? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Um, thank you for being a part of my dad's life and our family's life. Um, he loved us all, and he would be missed. Um, my dad was a man with many personalities. And uh, I tell you, I'm going to miss him, because he's the only one that gets my jokes. <laughs> I've been told from my family members and my husband, Things that you think are funny are just not funny. So, thanks, Dad. Uh, I got that from you. I feel as if we were so blessed to have my father and my mother in our lives. We were not easy children. Um, at all. But we knew that we always had my parents' love. And I, I thank you for that, Mom. And Dad knows how much that he was appreciated by us all. So I'm going to sign off now. And the last thing my dad said to me was, I'll see you around. So he knew he was going, but it was a little too soon. But thank you for being here. We had this very well organized, but if you leave it to me, it falls apart. Um, our next speaker is Coach Ray Tanamoto. where he was trying to get the coaching staff set up for basketball and we both trans transferred from Watsonville High School to be here and so I talked to Bill and I said uh, what are the chances of uh, opening for coaching in basketball and he said well right now I've got all my coaching staff I said okay I said but uh, if anything happens just let me know and lo and behold uh, a couple, couple weeks later, he said, uh, I have an opening because a person that uh, wanted to coach decided to take a job as department chair 
And so I said, and so he offered me the job. And that turned out to be, I tell you, the best thing that ever happened to me because I was going to be working with someone who I didn't really know but knew that he was the guy that was going to lead our school in the basketball. And so he said that I'll give you the lightweight program. And he also had, uh, I think Norm, Norm uh, Hagen was the JV coach that he selected. And so we coached together for three years until Steve came along. And so Steve and I was, was with Warmer for another umpteen years. And I tell you, it was the greatest ride of our lives because Warmer not only had this, he knew how to teach basketball and get this kid ready for anything and everything. And I'll give you some examples. He made the Aptos program one of the best in the Monterey Bay area, and he did it. I, I tell you, it was amazing to us. He was a man of few words, but the words he did speak made a big difference as far as those athletes being able to perform on the court. Not only as athletes, but I tell you, he made everyone better people. Because warmer, a lot of people thought it was loosey-goosey and all that kind of stuff. But hey, he knew how to get to the players. So they put forth the best effort and they played it like he wanted them to do it. And he was able to do it by teaching, but allowing them to have some freedom as far as executing. That's one thing about Warner that uh, has me remembering him and what he did. And as Matt Mark mentioned, you know, he had a lot of success as far as the CCS and winning the Northern California Championship and so forth. And I tell you, he had a way of bringing this community together. This place was packed, and as you know, mighty hot. But we all were there because he put forth a product by having these young men being able to put forth such a great effort. And he was the one that was the leader. And Steve and I, we sure learned a lot from him and made our own teams much better by knowing how to coach. And Warmer was the one who gave us a lot of help as far as knowing how to work with kids. Because I was a young, very inexperienced, but I learned a lot. I went to, I took some classes and so forth and, and went, went to workshops, but I listened to Warmer, watched Warmer, and he was the ultimate teacher as far as being able to get the most out of his players. You guys have seen in the papers and heard from people about all his outstanding accomplishments, the CCS, Northern California champs and so forth. But one, one thing that I will always remember that Warmer knew ways in which to get his kids fired up. One was music. Believe it or not, when that class I came out for warm-ups, and I think you guys remember this, the loud music vibrating in this gym. And the, my favorite was Born to Run. And that one was just perfect. So, you know, those are things that you think about nowadays and say, hey, but hey, he knew what he was doing and he knew how to get his kids ready. And I tell you, one of a kind, one of a kind. A few years after Aptos was opened, he, a group of people in the community, a lot of our boosters said, hey, let's get some type of youth program going on so we can build a program for youth basketball. And Warren said, hey, yeah, that's a great idea. So he said, yeah, so it's coaches, we got to get together and we'll do our part. Well, the community was so great. I mean, I, I couldn't, 
There's too many of you people out there to name that got this thing really rolling. And Warmer said, hey, yeah, we can start a program here. So the three of us, Steve and Warmer and I, said, okay, this is what we can do. We can, we can set up the gym, we can, we can run programs here that can help, and the community's going to set up the, the uh, go through the, all the river rang you have to do in order to set up a program here at the school. And so we said, okay. So Steve and, and Bill and I, they said, okay, this is what we can do. We'll get our varsity players to be the, the referees, and we're going we're gonna to be doing these certain things, and, and you guys can take care of the rest. And I tell you, this community stepped forward, and we had a program set up in one year, and I tell you, that grew and grew, and I think that's what helped have these kids growing up, learning the basics from day one, improving each year they, they play, and because we had kids from 9 through 14 playing in this, and so it was a fun league, and, and it was great to see our players doing the officiating and, and learning from that how officials look at the game. So it was a win-win for everyone, and I, I tell you, that's a, one part of this school that I will never forget, is the that program. One thing that always remained in my mind is, back in April of 2002, they started the Aptos High School Hall of Fame, and Warmer was one of the number one guys that was on that list. And Warmer was the one that started something special here at Aptos High. And I tell you, you know, a lot of people sometimes didn't understand Warmer, but hey, everything he did came from right here. He knew what he wanted to accomplish, and he got the help that he needed to get this program going and the whole bit. And I tell you, it was one of the best things in the world. And but one thing that I really feel that Warmer cared about not only his athletes, he cared for people here at the school. And I'm gonna name Bobby Salazar because he was the one that introduced Warmer in the Hall of Fame ceremony. And why do you think he did that? Because Bobby meant this to him. He's the one that was a custodian here, took good care of the campus, was a die-hard former dam and Aptos Mariner fan, and I tell you, he did so much for this school. So Warmer felt, and, and you know, only Warmer could see that, that he should be given some credit, and so he had Bobby introduce himself to the Hall of Fame night. No. It was, also, it was one of those things where I will always remember that Warmer was able to look at people and say, hey, these are certain things that I should do because they do so much for me. And Warmer made a great thing when he said, no, coaching basketball is not the only thing in life. Being with people, treating people, is the thing that I look at. So, you know, as mentioned by Chris, that you know all the sports that Warmer coached and so forth, he loved it. He loved coaching, and the kids loved him because Warmer had the demeanor of caring. Yeah, it's funny, but you know, a guy that big. I mean, he he was six six. Pretty awesome looking as far as if you're a young freshman, sophomore, looking up to him. But hey, he had a soft voice. And every time that I can remember that we would come in at halftime, yeah, he would yell once in a while. That's part of coaching. But I never heard him use profanity. 
He said, well, I guess the closest thing was, gosh darn it, <laughs> really. And that's one thing that has stuck in here. No, Warmer was a first class guy, and I, a person I will never forget. And special notes. This one I saved for last. These are things that Warmer really loved. His wife Pat and his seven children. Those were the important things to him. He loved teaching, he loved coaching, but as mentioned earlier, he loved his garden. He really did. That is where I think he found peace, a place to think about things. And I tell you, it's a surprise because I, I didn't know that, but uh, my wife reminded me, well, remember that time that uh, he was showing us how to cut roses so that you are doing it the right way and that you're going to have a bunch of good rose bushes? And I said, oh, that's right. And that's why we have 24 rose bushes in our yard now, <laughs> because I know how to trim, cut, take care of them. So, you know, those are the things that, you know, really, really mean special to us. Hey, Warmer liked to play cards. Oh, did he love to play cards. And a bunch of us, Jim Michelson, Ken Harrison, Tibor Schoenfeld, uh, there are about five or six of us would get together when Warmer says, hey, well, it's about time we had a poker game. And that's what we do, we'd go, and we would rotate houses. And we'd go have a great time. And I'll tell you, Warmer really set us up because he was a darn good player. Seldom did he lose. But hey, we had a heck of a lot of fun and we were able to, to get together and just have a few beers and play cards and have a good time. But that was warmer. <laughs> Things I will never forget about Warmer. His great sense of humor. And I tell you, he could say the shortest number of words and make it funny. <laughs> I tell you, depending on the situation, he always had something to say that made us laugh. And I mentioned this one a little earlier. His favorite thing to say was, gosh darn it, <laughs> things weren't going well. I never heard him swear. I never heard him swear at his players. He'd get upset and he'd stomp his feet and do that type of thing, but he never swore. And he was highly respected by his players and peers, I tell you. And that's got to be number one on the list when those out there that know you, watch you, say, hey, you know, that's, that's a great guy right there. And I'll tell you, and I think many of you people know that he played a great influence on you in your lives because he certainly did for me. And Warner was a good person and a good friend to me. And I did appreciate, appreciate it, having the opportunity to teach, coach, and work with him. Thank you, Warner, for the memories. You touched the lives of so many people. And you will always be in our hearts. Thank you. I'm a little serious today because Bill was always serious. <laughs> that was a joke. Um, it's an honor to be here today. I guess I could move 
look that up for them. <laughs> to pay tribute to Coach Warmerdale, the man that changed my life for good. Not that I'm emotional or anything, but life is full of choices. I chose my wife 55 years ago in high school. Good choice. We chose to come to Aptos 52 years ago. Good choice. I chose to be a teacher and basketball coach. Good choice. I chose to apply to Aptos High as a freshman basketball coach. Very good choice. Coach Warmerdam chose me to join him as a freshman team coach. I joined not only Bill, but Ray Tanamoto, coaching JVs. We were a team of three, working together for a long time. It was a good choice, a great chapter of learning in my life. Long before I became a teacher, I knew my real dream was to be a high school basketball coach. And thank God Bill Warmerdam gave me that dream. When I was nine, my dad died of cancer. So after that, I grew up without a dad that would have taught me a lot about sports and basketball in particular. As I matured, uh, in my young years, he did give me a love and respect for sports. He was an athlete, football, baseball, basketball. And I grew up, I looked for coaches and athletes that I could respect and learn from. In high school, believe it or not, it was a diving coach. She was an Olympic diver who became my art teacher, and my diving coach, and my encourager in high school truly one of the most influential persons in my growing up years. The other athletic coach who changed my life and gave me a chance to be the coach I wanted to be, Bill Warmerdam. My older brother always criticized me for being so emotional. <laughs> I'll be forever grateful to Bill for giving me the opportunity when I was 24 and the father of two young children. And by the way, two more were born right after I began coaching. One during the dad's tournament in December and the other at a tournament in Salinas. I made it to both deliveries, however, the warmer day way. Since the moment I heard Bill had passed away, my heart and my soul begin to reflect on his influence on my life as a friend and a neighbor. We only lived a couple blocks away. I didn't know that at the time. He was a mentor and a fellow coach. We met as neighbors and I discovered our mutual love of basketball. And I dashed home after meeting him and said to my wife, Jan, guess who I met today? <laughs> Coincidentally, Warner was the varsity coach at Aptos High and needed a freshman coach. Well, voila, my career as a coach began and I became his freshman coach. I was teaching over at Real Del Mar Elementary School with a history degree and a teaching credential all the way through 12th grade. After I started coaching, I drove to the two campuses each day during the season. My first high school coaching job for one year only were football and baseball way up in Fort Bragg, California. It was clear they were not my first choice. I had a love affair with basketball my whole life. And my time at Aptos High with these two men, 
Ray Tamuoto and Coach Warmer, excuse me. Warmer gave me the opportunity to fulfill the dream of going on to become a varsity coach. He gave me the fresh job at Aptos and I became a part of the successful coaching trio. And along the way, Bill's wife, Pat, and my wife, Jim, became good friends and supporters of one another and of Bill and me. Being a coach's wife is a tough job. Probably tougher than being the coach. <laughs> they hear all the comments, and that's why you see them sitting way up in the bleachers. <laughs> Hello, dear. <laughs> a little isolated from the comments about the men they're married to. Well, for nearly, I guess, 20 years or less, Bill and I were a team along with Ray, and I learned the ins and outs of coaching. My two mentors, the best of the best. Ray was disciplined and organized and a relational coach. Bill was a little more relaxed, a little more flexible, as well as relational. I wasn't quite as relaxed as Bill, nor as disciplined as Ray. He kind of fell in between, and I learned from both of them. Although I never used the yardstick to demonstrate and practice, as Bill was accustomed to doing. Bill was not the lecturing type. I guess in driver's ed, you don't lecture too much. He let the boys play, and every now and then, tell them how to do it better. I didn't exactly stay calm as the two of them. Especially when an official made a call I didn't like. In fact, Warmer pulled me aside one day at practice and said, You either need to calm down or you'd have to find a new frost coach. <laughs> he did say I was right most of the time, but the whistle rules. Fortunately, I learned from both, and I took the best of both and became my own coach. A blend of two of the best coaches in Santa Cruz, Monterey County. In the Olympics of 2004, the U.S. team with the likes of LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Tim Duncan, and Allen Iverson, they finished third in the Olympics. Argentina and Italy were ahead of them. It was an assumption that they would win the gold. Why only the bronze? Because they played with an I in team. They played as individuals, not as a team. Aptos basketball under Coach Warmerdam played with that no I in team. That was our motto. Warmer made sure they played as a team, not as individuals. And that's part of the reason the championships followed. Trust your coach and your teammates the warmer, aptos way. Warmer's players loved him and they had fun while playing for him. Winning all those 10 league titles, CCS, NorCal championships, you can see what he did. Warmer put aptos on the map. The town went crazy, yet as Ray said, Bill was always humble, and his sense of humor served him well. After my years of coaching at Aptos High with Bill and Ray, I accepted a position as a varsity coach locally. I still look forward to Bill's thoughts, words of wisdom. His house would be on my way home from practice as we lived in the same neighborhood. He would often be out in the front yard gardening, and after games, I'd swing by. We'd chat. He'd give me congratulations or condolences. It was easy talk. It was easy for him to share my struggles. 
He actually kept up with my games and always knew the score. That's the ongoing mentor part that Coach Warmer Dam had. As neighbors and friends, we shared really hard times along with amazingly good times and the victories. I will cherish those times and I will miss him. Good coaches help athletes to play the best as an individual and as a team member. Good coaches know their sport. Good coaches can communicate and listen. A necessity, and Bill did this. Bill did not belittle, he didn't mock or insult his players. If he did, I didn't know about it, anybody else there. <laughs> There's a book I've been reading for the second time. It's called My Losing Season by Pat Conroy. It gave me another look at two opposite coaching styles. Conroy played at the Citadel, a military academy college in Charleston, South Carolina. He played for a coach that he and his teammates had little respect for. I recommend you read it, although the language can be a little salty, so be careful. To get a full idea of a coach that can't relate to his players, and then, looking at Coach Warmerdam, you can get a picture of the opposite. Warmerdam was a relational coach. We never had a losing season, no matter what our record was. High school sports, it's about learning to respect each other, our coaches, our school, our opponents, as well as the sport. Warmer taught us that. I just want to take a moment to tell Pat and her family, Susie, Chris, Barbie, Heidi, the grandkids, that your husband, your father and grandfather, was instrumental in my career, in my love affair with basketball and life. The farmer in him, the one who complained about the gophers in the front yard and deer that ate his roses in the backyard, the dad that still grew pumpkins in the front yard, and later, as you know, displaying blue ribbons from the county fair for all of us to appreciate. It reminds me that he never gave up and he kept things in perspective. His sense of humor and his celebration was always there. I owe a lot to Bill for my success over the years as a coach and as a human being. We shared a lot in life together. As we age, we may not remember the wins, the losses, the coaches, and even all the players' names. But one thing I do know, I will remember Bill and will cherish my time with Warmer as my friend, my neighbor, and my mentor coach. He gave me the opportunity to fulfill my lifetime dream of being a high school basketball coach. Thanks, Warmer. Rest in peace. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Next, I'd like to avoid, invite Coach Bobby Williams up to the podium. share memories of Bill, and not the Bill that a lot of people are talking about, that's the older Bill Warmerdam. When I first met Bill Warmerdam, I was a 14-year-old sophomore at Wattsville High School, and he was a brand new teacher. That made Warmer 28 years old. Okay. He was massive, I was tiny. I was five foot six and weighed about 100 pounds, and Warmer was this giant that coached our C&D basketball team. 
By the way, whoever keeps the records, I don't know if you have that on his win total, but it should be. He had an undefeated C and D team that year. That was great. Uh, so Warmer came in, and he was he was it was a secret that he was going to be the Aptos coach. He couldn't tell us at that time. But in the second half of the year, he came, found me, and says, "Hey, do you know how to drive?" I said, well, "Yeah, I've driven." He goes, "Good." I went and got your name. You're, I'm doing driver's training for you. I said, oh, "Great, this will be fun." He goes, "Yeah, yeah." Meet me in front of the, the gym over there, and I'll pick you up. Warmer comes driving up in a GTO. I went, "Whoa!" Look at this. And here's little O.E. He hops out of the car. He runs around. He goes, "Get in. Let's go." I hop in the GTO, I couldn't reach the pedals. <laughs> here's 6'6", six, six, here's 5'6". Six. I couldn't reach. And I'm going, how do you move this seat up? He goes, I thought you knew how to drive. <laughs> I do, I don't know how to move the seat. Warmer, how do I get the seat up? He gets the seat up, and he, he, he took me out for probably three times as many hours as you're supposed to have as a driver training student. We drove all over Watsonville, Moss Landing, Monterey, all over like everybody. But the entire time, we talked about basketball. And he was so excited to be coming to Aptos High School to start a program and to put his stamp on it. And he certainly did. Warmer, it, we've sit in amazement when you start thinking at the families that have come through Aptos High School and have the opportunity to play for Warmer and Aptos. The brothers, the Gruber brothers, there's three of them. The Holtz, there's three of them. The McDulties, there's two of them. The Walters, there's three of them. The Updikes, there's two of them. I, there's a lot I'm forgetting because it's all off the top of my head, but amazing players that they had rolled through here. And it was just so much fun for me to be part of that in Bill's first two years here at Outpost High School. I played for him in 69 and in 70 to 71. And I left here and I went and played for Bob Bogowski, graduated. When I went to San Jose State, I talked to Warmer. I said, hey, Warmer, I'm going to change my major. I'm going to be a PE coach. I'm going to get into coaching. I'm going to teach PE. He goes, good. When you're done, when you get your degree, come here. You can have my job. <laughs> well, he didn't realize. I, I kind of like that idea. That's why I got into coaching. I wanted this job. So I tell Warmer, I say, hey, OK. So I get done, and I helped up at San Lorenzo Valley one year while I was doing my student teaching, my last year, my sixth year of school. And then I did my student teaching at SoCal, and I coached with Pete Newell at Santa Cruz. And then I announced to Warmer, hey, Warmer, I'm ready. I'm ready. He goes, yeah, not quite yet, not quite yet. <laughs> so it was the best thing for both of us. Warmer allowed me to move on to a college career. Because if I would have been the Aptos coach, I don't know if I ever would have left. I mean, it's a great, fun and community and environment. Those type of players, Warmer Dam had a really good thing going. And he knew it, and he appreciated it. Now, when you walk in this gym, first of all, I mean, you can't walk in this gym without going, why did they put the court this way <laughs> instead of that way? It made no sense, and Warmer used to talk about it from day one. They have these big beams up there. We had a young man on our team named Brant Carter that shot the highest shot in America, and he would almost hit those beams all the time. Group shot pretty high shot, too. He would hit them. I couldn't reach the beams from my seat on the bench next to Bill Warmer. Here. But we had a wrestling mat at this end, and if you played for Warmer, you remember the wrestling mat. Okay, Warmer would plop himself down on the wrestling mat while he would tell us to scrimmage or play one-on-one -on -one or play horse that day because we needed to work on our ability to shoot. So we had a lot of different things that happened on that wrestling mat. Okay? So my very first, or my, my first year of starting here, my senior year, Warmer Dam had a roll of tape like this. And this was Warmer's scouting report. I didn't know any better. Warmer would write the numbers of the opposing team starters on a roll of tape. And he would come up to you, you'd shoot layups, he'd come up and go, wait, you got 25. He's pretty good. He'd walk off. He'd go get the next guy. So one time Warmer comes up to me, we're playing North Salinas, and they had a kid named Steinbeck who was a very good player. He walks up and he goes, Williams. You got number 25. 
he's pretty good. I said, Coach, I can't guard you. And he looks at me, he goes, you're right. <laughs> Williams, we're in a zone. All right, that's good. It was so funny, the team launched it, and they're all laughing at it, it was really good. So I was given some marching orders today. One of them was from uh, Bob Bogowski and the Bogowski family. They're unable to be here, but they wanted me to, to tell Pat and the Warburton family how much sorrow and condolences they have for losing Bill, but how many warm memories they have. Bobby Jr. played for him. The girls, let's face it, the girls probably could have played for the basketball team here. All Bob's daughters were really good players. Uh, and they said their best. And then Pete Newell, I'm on the phone with him today for, you know, I'd like to have had a 10 minute conversation, but if you know Pete Newell, that is not possible. So I talked to Newell for a couple hours and he gave me a really good story about Warmer that I thought I would share with you that really explains both men. I got to coach two years with Pete, and I learned an awful lot of basketball because it's constant 24-7. And so I had the balance of having two great or three great years with Bill Warmerdam and perspective, and then two years with Pete Newell where it was a little obsessive at times, but it was really good basketball. So Newell has a very good team, he thinks, and he thinks Aptos is his rival. And I'm there at that time, I'm the JV coach, and I said, Pistol, I think a rival is where both teams look at each other like you're the team to beat. I go, Ow. I was a teacher and a basketball coach, and now I'm an administrator. So this place is near and dear to my heart. I'm honored to be here today to celebrate a place where the legacy of Mariner basketball was born under his leadership a place of many great moments and lasting memories. I first experienced the legacy of Mariner basketball in the mid-1980s as a basketball player from Gilroy High School, and we played against Aptos High. I respected the way Aptos played. It was a game that I looked forward to. It was a great competitive challenge to play against Aptos. I admired the way Coach Wolverdam coached his teams. They seemed to have a certain style and a competitive grit that always made them formidable opponents. I remember my junior year, we played against Aptos in this gym. Great high school basketball atmosphere, big crowd, and it was a game against two great teams. As I started warm warming up, I turned to my teammate and said, man, it's hot in here. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't need my warm-ups that night. After I started working here, I heard the coach warmer down stories about turning up the heat. I thought to myself, that guy, I respect the coach who wants to make the home court so uncomfortable for the opponent. And, and it did indeed make me uncomfortable, and he accomplished that feat. On a personal level, Coach, Coach Wormerdam's son, Chris, and I were teammates at Cabrillo. Chris was a great teammate, great competitor, and a great player. He led by example, and he always strove to make his teammates better. I'm sure his character strengths were developed and fostered by the mentoring of his dad. As a player, I always felt that as long as Chris was on our side, we had a chance of winning. His grit and desire were definitely a strong force. He has a great sense of humor and is someone that I respect and call my friend. In the fall of 1996, I started teaching and coaching basketball at Aptos High, and I had the opportunity to get to know Coach Wormerdam on a personal level. He was a man of character, admirable values, and had a great sense of humor. He became someone that I greatly admired and respected and truly enjoyed being around. The legacy of Mariner basketball is near and dear to me. That legacy began with Coach Warmerdam. It is a legacy of respect, commitment, honor, with a strong belief in supporting one another for the greater good on and off the court. A legacy filled with examples of an indomitable spirit with a strong will to never give up. 
Over the many years, coaches, players, families, and other community members have benefited from Coach Wormerdam's mentorship, both on and off the court. We are all better because of him and the man he was. As the boys' varsity coach, I have been honored to carry on this legacy. I have a strong personal, personal commitment to pass it on to the future generations of the Mariner basketball family. I remember clearly whenever Coach Wormerdam came to a game, all of the players and coaches would hustle over and shake his hand before the game out of reverence and respect. I remember after a game during my first year of coaching, our team played well and we won. Coach was at the game and he came up to me and said, now that's Mariner basketball. That compliment from the man who started Mariner basketball meant a lot to me. I've never forgotten those words and sometimes when we would win a hard fought game, I could still hear him say to me now, now that's Mariner basketball. I'll always remember and truly appreciate my conversations with Coach. His wisdom guided me and his humor always left me smiling. I always felt better after being in his company. I was blessed to know him. He may be physically gone, but his legacy will live on in each of us. He will be watching, and in some way, he will let us know when we are getting it right as we will hear a whisper from somewhere that will tell us, now that's Mariner basketball. Live on, coach. Thank you. And now it's uh, my honor to introduce Coach Jamie Townsend. to everything that has been said. Um, I'm hoping so, uh, but the theme is strong. There's no question about who Warmer Dan is. Um, as I was asked to, to speak, I started thinking, all right, I need to reflect back 52 years, because it was 52 years ago, after trying to go to Hawaii and get a coaching job and serve, serve and be outdoors. And I wasn't really welcome because I was a howly. I came home. I got a job quickly over at Roy Grandy High School because there was an accident. They lost their PD teacher, their swim coach, and a water polo coach. I never taught swimming, never taught uh, water polo. But I took the job because it was my first paid job ever. The athletic director said, you've been hired, I don't know who you are, but I hope you'll stay here for two years. Well, there was a clue there, but I wasn't quite sure what it was. So, 52 years ago, Ronald Reagan was our governor. He had established something really strong, and he was being prepared for the presidency. And there were no jobs available other than this one lucky one. And because if you were alive, you will remember every first year employee that was a state employee was fired to balance the California budget. <laughs> so yes, I took the first job I could find. It was a mistake. <laughs> I didn't make it through this, well I made it through the year but as a swim coach, after California had already passed a law saying dress codes aren't allowed, you get to go to school without wearing certain clothes, hair length, could touch the collar, uh, you could have facial hair, the law was clear. 
Well, nobody in Arroyo Grande understood that law. And I was called into the athletic director and was told flat out, you have a swimmer that has a mustache. And I said, I do? <laughs> well, I, I later I realized he had this little platinum 17-year-old mustache that I never saw, but I was told to take him off my team, get him to shave his mustache. And I said, you do it. I am not going to fuck, dismiss this athlete from the, from the swim program. And by the way, if you do dismiss him, I am resigning at the end of the school year. Of course, I was gone. Where am I going? Well, I used to surf, ride bikes here while I was finishing my degree at San Jose State. So I said, I'm going back to Santa Cruz. And I'm going to spend a year substituting, probably because there will be no jobs available. And in that period of time, I met Coach Warmerdam at that time. I didn't know he was warmer yet. And I wanted to go to every school and find out where could I fit and call that school probably my home for life. Well, I did that, and what I found was, as I substituted here occasionally, and more later, I went looking for the athletic director. I found him. He was shirtless, baggy shorts, pretty old tennis shoes, and he's walking his PE class, which, up a trail, only some of us will know, because we'd go up the trail to the pond. Yeah, there really is a pond up there. Now I'm sure it's dry as hell, but here he is, beautiful sunny day, his shirt's off, the boys' shirts are off, there's not really a dress code with uh, PE clothes, and that was my first impression. I kind of like this here. This is not a Royal Randy. So at the end of that period of time, I knew there was one school better than the rest, and it was Aptos. And so I focused really hard to get here. And I got really lucky. I had an English degree, and thank God they gave leave back then for pregnant women, and the late English teacher decided she wasn't going to come back. She knew what her goals were, she wanted to be a mother, and, and wasn't going to work full time. So I became an English teacher. My second impression with Bill was when I was told nobody gets to go into his practices. <laughs> Doors are locked. He doesn't want a soul to know what's going on. It's between he and his players. So here I'm an English teacher. I just finished coaching football. Basketball's in full season, and I have to sneak in here to get something. So I sneak in, quiet as can be, right through that door, and yes, there was Warner on a stack of foldable uh, gymnastic uh, mats, but he's laying down on the side. No one seems to want to talk about this, but I, you know, you remember, he's got one elbow like this, he's laying out sideways, and a cigarette in the other <laughs> And that's when I realized, it is hotter than hell than <laughs> And so now I know why the doors are always locked, no one can come in, and he's coaching, in the best style that he thought would work for him and his players. And of course, I'm just 24 years old. Think I'm a great football coach because I played college football. You know, yeah, not, not even close to knowing what I was up to as far as becoming a better coach. And, I, and he didn't really pay attention to me. So I just stayed over there in the corner. And I already saw the, the players. And, Mike, he must have been one of them. Up, no, no. Oh, you're gone? 
That's right, you graduated, you were the first, never mind. <laughs> anyway, some of you were there, they were just wet, I mean just head to toe, drenched. So I knew they'd already been running full court, back and forth. But I had to see what the secrets were, because there were some people that were jealous of him. And that they were the ones that couldn't beat him, and they couldn't understand that whatever he was doing, they wanted to know, but they didn't. So I said, okay, I'm just going to watch a little bit. And as they would run back and forth between pops, he would go, run faster! <laughs> court press and I'm just going okay that's a secret <laughs> work them let them have fun run like hell shoot there were no plays there's none of that but I was only there for five to ten minutes but what I learned was the second reason why I wanted to be at Aptos and that was there's more than one way to coach and be a champion and so, as a young coach, I started realizing maybe you have to have your own personality as a person to get the job done and don't make it mechanical. So, at that point, the third reason I wanted to be here was when I went to my first, second game in this gym, everybody's excited, it's overflowing, and pretty soon the doors, are get, they get closed. The game's going to start. And then I can hear people in the stands saying, why are they closing the doors? It's so hot in here. <laughs> and, and I already know that, that I would, I would, my, my wife up, up to now, 45 years later, she was a volleyball player, and, she, and I said, come, you've got to come and see the game. It's really exciting. But I said, Wear shorts and wear a t-shirt. You know, it's, it's in the middle of the winter. I said, she said that. I go, trust me, wear shorts and a t-shirt. You might enjoy the game a lot more. And those that knew would show up as if it was summer. The rest would be just going, what's going on? I said, and some would say, oh, the fans are broken. No, the fans aren't turned on. Well, why are the doors closed? Oh, it must be because the marshal, fire marshals, we can't let any more in. We've got to close it up. Well, the rest of us are going, yeah, right. <laughs> and so the game's awesome. The players didn't score 100. The fans are excited. The players are slightly disappointed. But no one would ever know what Coach Warmerdam thought because he would take his players, he would talk to them in private, and the rest of us would still be wondering, how is he doing it? Well, he's doing it based on everything that's already been said. So I'm not gonna rehash that. But that was the third reason why I said, I need to stay at Aptos. This is an awesome place. Well, my age gives it away. And there's no question, I'm still coaching at Aptos High. So the last thing I really want to say that is, a, is slightly different, but it's still the same thing, is that Bill was an influencer. And I want to thank Bill for setting the tone and giving Aptos the direction that's still here at this awesome school. Thank you. comes to my mind when I think of Coach Warmerdam. We all at some point in our lives run into a teacher, a coach, a parent, a friend, a partner that has a, an influence in your life. It kind of forces you up a certain path even though you don't know you're going that way. 
and Coach Warmerdam was just that guy. Now, Coach Warmerdam had his flaws. For instance, I tried to explain to him, technically, gosh is a four-letter word, but it really doesn't have an impact. The other thing about Coach Warmerdam, and I coached against him, is he wasn't an X and O guy. He just wasn't. That wasn't his thing. But he had three traits, in my mind, that made him exceptional. The first thing he had was he had the ability to instill a self-belief in all his players. When I was a junior at that time, that was Aptos opened in the fall of 69. All high school students from Aptos went to Watsonville. So I was a junior at Watsonville, and I fought really hard to win the starting job with the Wildcats. And it was about the middle of the season, and there was an announcement that the new football coach, which was Wayne Johnson, wanted to have a meeting of all uh, prospective players for the next year for Aptos. So he had it in the classroom, and I kind of snuck in the back and hid in the back, listened to his meeting. And after that, went left, and practice was right after school, and I was shooting hoops, and I'm kind of shooting hoops, getting ready for practice. And out of the corner of my eye, I see Co Coach Goykovich making a beeline right for me. I go, oh shit. So, that's a four letter word that he never used. <laughs> uh, so he comes up to me and he says, are you going to Aptos next year? I said, yes. He pivots, we have practice. I never saw the playing court the rest of the year. <laughs> so I'm walking off after our last game and I remember this distinctly. And Coach Warmerdam, walks out of the stands, comes and puts his arm around me and said, don't worry, next year the team is yours. Make sure you get a lot of shots up between now and then, and I'll see you at open gym. The second thing about Coach Warmer down was he had the great ability to think outside the box. I remember it was the summer, uh, between the junior and senior year, I was over at his house, I don't remember why, but I distinctly remember he walks up to me and he hands me this book. It is called Blitz Basketball, and it's by a guy named Bob Samaras. Bob Samaras was a coach in Detroit, and later went and coached in Canada at the University of Windsor. And Bob Samaras' theory was, you were to get up as many shots as you could, as fast as you could, and create as much defense as uh, uh, chaos on defense as you possibly could. And you wanted to speed the game up. And his theory was if you got up more shots than the other team, the chances were you were going to win. Now, you got to remember at the time, most varsity high school games, there was no shot clock, there was no three point line. Most games were in the 40s. So, right out of the shoot, when we start the season, we're scoring in the 80s and the 90s, and in a couple cases, 100 points. And nobody had seen that. And the places are starting to pack because they want to see this team. And in the first year alone, and on that day, Coach Warmerdam had created a legacy because we were playing a style of basketball that nobody was playing at the time. There was no LMU yet. There was no West Head, there was none of that. So he was way ahead of his time. The third thing about Coach Warmerdam that I thought kind of set him apart was he made it fun. It was always fun. He never lost perspective that it was a game. And if you were having fun, you were playing your best. And later on when I coached, I always remembered that about Coach Warmer now. And I always kept a, a little collection of drills that I'd have. And when our team was getting stale in practice, or uh, usually after a tough loss, I would throw those in, raise the energy of the team, because I always remember, as Coach Williams said, it was always fun. And I was fortunate enough to play four years of college basketball after high school. And I can say, unequivocally, the most fun I've ever had playing basketball was for Coach Warmer. 
Mark pointed out that Coach coached multiple sports. The first year he was the cross country coach, he was the basketball coach, and he was the baseball coach. Now, yeah, he liked coaching, but he had so many kids at home, he needed the extra money too, so <laughs> let's be honest. Well, anyway, so the thing about Coach Warmerdam is he was not a complex individual. He was very simple. I remember our, our signs that we had, like if he wanted you to steal a base, he'd go. <laughs> if, if he wanted you to bunt, he'd go. And if he wanted you to take a pitch, he'd just go. <laughs> so, another characteristic that Coach had that really has been mentioned, he was the consummate scrounge. Uh, the first year Aptos is here, there was no baseball field, there was no football field, there were no tennis courts, there was no swimming pool. So, like I said, he was the first baseball coach. So what they did, where the baseball field is now, they kind of graded the circle out, kind of where the diamond is now. They got uh, this backstop that's made out of cyclone fencing, something probably mm, upscounted from a elementary school. And the left field, there was a trench that went through the middle of left field. It was about three to four feet high. And since the bathrooms were way up here, you can imagine what that trench was used for. <laughs> In right field, there was a grade that went up, and at the very top of the grade was a huge oak tree. But his biggest find was, he comes up with this, I'm gonna say loosely, a pitching machine. Now these were a new concept, and this was probably a prototype. And I'm telling you, it's crude. You would crank it up, it had no guards, and it had an arm like a catapult. And you would stand behind it, and you would put the ball on it, step back, and it would fire the ball. And if you were lucky, you would get, oh, two out of 10 within three feet of the strike zone. And batting practice was, you go, okay, everybody gets 10 pitches. And you would go stand up there, he'd load up this thing, and you would stand there. And if none of your 10 pitches came within strike, well, it times up. <laughs> and you would leave. That pitching machine, one day he sits it and he puts it on, and that thing fires that thing, makes a strict right, and hits the third baseman right in the air hole, <laughs> and decks him. And that was the end of the pitching issue. <laughs> so we're, we're kind of starting, we're starting the year, and we kind of middle around preseason, and we're about ready to start league. And like I said, we didn't have a diamond, so we always took a bus. And we're gonna open with Soquel High, Coach Ron Walters, and Soquel was one of the favorites. At the time we were in the NBL, there were 10 teams, five from San Andreas County and five from Monterey County. And we're going to play Soquel. And Soquel was really good. They had just come off beating Bellarmine, Leland, and Willow Glen all in about a week's time. And we're over there. And I would always sit up with Coach, because I always enjoyed his company, and I was a kiss ass. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and he shows me the lineup, and I look at it, and he goes, Coach, this sucks. And he goes, what? I said, no, the lineup, Coach. He, 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 I know baseball's not your thing, but this lineup, it's not very good. He goes, oh, yeah? That's one great thing about Warmer. He would always listen to his players. And I said, hey, give me a shot. He says, okay, go ahead. So I made out a lineup, and I handed it to him. So we play SoCal, and Nick Hathaway was our pitcher, and he throws a no-hitter. We beat him two to nothing. We get on the bus, and of course I have this big, wide-ass grin, and he goes, okay, you can do the lineup the rest of the year, but I decide who pitches, and I still have a right or first refusal if I don't like it. And honestly, that's when I decided, you know what, I can do this coaching thing. And I always thank him. There was one other story I'd like to tell which tells you a lot about the man. Uh, we, early in the year, 
We are driving up, like you say, a bus. It was a Saturday game, and we're driving to Coverly High School, which is, I think, in Palo Alto. It's not there anymore, I don't believe. And we get up to the game, and on our team at the time, we had two guys who had hair down to their shoulders. Okay, now this is 1970. You know, you have civil rights, you have Vietnam. There's a lot of, you know, summer love. You have a lot of... <laughs> As Jamie said, it was a controversial issue, although not with Warmer and certainly not with Aptos. Well, we get there and we're taking infield and you can kind of hear these cat calls and they're from parents and they're kind of saying stuff like that. And we get done with infield and we get in and we're getting all ready and Warmer's out there exchanging cards with the manager and I see, well, for Warmer it was a heated discussion. By my standards, it really wasn't heated, but that, that was the gist. He comes back to the dugout and he goes, everybody get on the bus. We're out of here. So we just packed up our stuff, we got on the bus, I said, coach, what's up? He goes, he, the, the coach on the other team says they won't play us as long as we play those two long hair and hippies. True story. Which taught me, one, that coach would always let you be who you were. Two, he would always stand up for his kids. Three, he liked to take long rides. <laughs> <laughs> I will always be grateful that Coach Warmer down was in my life. Because I believe this. His legacy is not about wins or losses. It's about the person and who he affected and how many people he affected positively. And that will always be his legacy. And that, I thank you. Uh, <laughs> our next two speakers are the dynamic duo of Stu Walters and his brother Kevin. What happened to you, Matt? Thanks, Bru. Great, great job, great memory. Man, I can't even remember yesterday. Um, 45 years since we've been here, my much older brother Stu was a year, a year older than I was, and, and my mom's going to think it's funny that after 45 years, he's still hitting ninth in the lineup, which happened quite a bit. He's very comfortable there, but thanks for having us. Um, I'm the emotional one of, the, of our boys, so I'm going to keep my shades on. I'm going to keep it light, tell a couple more of our stories. Um, I played three years of basketball for him. Stu was on my team for two. I played with Billy, one of our best friends. Um, but one of the great things that Coach did early on was he elevated Billy and myself to his varsity team as sophomores. And, you know, we were young, we didn't know any better. Stu was our role model. We thought it'd be cool, but the best thing that happened to Billy and I on that promotion was we never had to play for Coach Tanamoto. <laughs> <laughs> Just to reiterate what everybody's been saying, the, the practices were spectacular in this gym. They, they, they were probably a lot of times our, our best competition to our team, for some reason, was always better than everyone else. So we got after it pretty good in this gym. And I remember the first practice in particular when we were sophomores. I didn't really know Warmer that well at the time. I was afraid of him for sure, but he was sitting on his mat. We came in here start shooting and uh, go throw a little motion offense on Billy and I was really excited and running up and down. Then we start scrimmaging, running up and down and we're holding our own but it's a pretty, pretty mature squad and so uh, Warmer would just blow his whistle and he'd just wave his arm and just say, get off, and you get on. And we're like, what's he doing? He keeps, he keeps doing this with his right arm. I have no idea what he's talking about. He's looking 
They're like, Billy, get off. Cast, cast or get off. And I was like, what is this? I, I look at Stu, but I'm just trying to keep up with everybody. So he keeps yelling, cast or get off, cast or get off. And I think that made me, you know, get down, bend your knees or something, and I have no idea what he's talking about. Finally, he tells me to cast, get up or get up. So I'm, now I'm out. So we get home that night, and mom's as excited as I am. How was practice? How was practice? I said it was great. You know, I, I think Billy and I are going to be fine. We'll fit right in. Stu's helped us, blah, blah, blah. But I guess, Stu, what, what does he mean? Cast or get off? I don't know. That defense? What, what is that? He goes, he didn't. Stu was always perfect, so he didn't call me what he should have at the time, but he said, figure it out, he needs he mean, you need to shoot more. And I kind of looked at my mom, and she looked at me and said, it's the first time I ever heard somebody say that about you. <laughs> and so from then on, we knew that we just had to cast or get off. Anywhere you were open, you got in more trouble with Warmer if you didn't shoot than if you did. He didn't care if you missed it. I was going to say 100, I don't miss 100, but I, I, I missed a few. I made a few along the way also, but our practices were fun. That's why we were good. We, we'd finish games on a Saturday, and we'd all end up at uh, LaSalle to play on Sunday because we just enjoyed playing basketball. The other one, uh, I mean, I, I have so many, but my younger brother, Matt, said, don't do it, don't do it. So <laughs> he, he, he limited me to two. Uh, but the other one I, I, I vividly remember was our, our last game. We, we were seniors, we were really good. I think we lost three, three or four games. We thought we were good. Until you go over the hill and then they get kind of taller, faster. <laughs> you know, we, we, I know everybody who played for one thinks they were on the best team. Um, but we, we definitely had the best team. Uh, in, in history that didn't have a player over six foot one. That is, that is for certain. But, so we get over there, we're playing Lincoln High School, and Warner comes in and says, I think we can hang with these guys. They're, they're not tall, they're tallest guys, six four. They score a lot. You know, he did his scouting, he looked at the Mercury News, and he said, yeah, they can score points like we do. I think we run up and down with them. Be pretty complimentary for them. And he always had a solution, right? Timeouts, let you call your own but he always could figure out what a team was doing, except this particular time. So we get out there, we're sizing them up, game starts, we thought we were fast. This team got off to it. I mean, Bruce Maddock would know the score exactly the first time out, but uh, I think it was like 16 to four, and we come out, I, I'm so tired, it's like I've played the entire game already, and we're three minutes in, and we call timeouts, because Warmer never called timeouts, we did, we're just tired, so we need one. We walk over, and the look on his face, you know, usually he would sit down and get down in his crouch, but he looked at me and went, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I, I knew exactly what he was thinking. He was thinking, we have no chance to beat this guy. <laughs> and, and, and we didn't. We, we, they, they destroyed us pretty handily, and it was our last game, so we, we get in there, we're bummed. We've been playing together for six years, and it was a very traumatic experience. So we're in the locker room just hanging our heads. <laughs> and we're kind of wondering, what's he going to do? What is he going to do to alleviate? And he walks in and says, with just this big grin, he says, they kick the crap out of it. <laughs> and we just all looked at him. He goes, he goes, don't hang your heads. Get on the bus. Let's go. He goes, if that team, if we played them 50 times, they would beat us all 50, so get on the bus and let's get on it. <laughs> it was a true pleasure playing for him. I mean, I, I, sorry, Matt told me two only, but if you, if you guys want to hear more, I've got five or six or ten more after, but I'm going to turn it over to the responsible one now so he can conclude it. Because like Warmer said, we, we've gone, we're probably in overtime right now. He did not like playing overtime games because he knew he was working and wasn't getting paid for it. So, <laughs> here's my brother, Steve. Thinking of some stories to tell because Warmer's the type of guy I think, and I, I didn't prepare anything, I was just kind of thinking. But it, whenever he's talking about Warmer, first thing that comes to my mind is he was just a classic. 
right? And everybody said, oh, Warmer was a classic. Oh, I saw Warmer the other day. Oh, he's a classic. <laughs> and so that, that, that's kind of fitting to me. Um, and everybody's got stories. Just standing here before we started, I think I heard like seven stories about him. You know, a lot of them we have that the guys have from the locker room that have played for them. We can't really probably tell, you know, in a crowd like this, but I mean, they're still classic and still funny and they make us laugh. But when I, I think, when did, I don't even know the year that Mid County, or Mid County, that's my, my league, that I, that I patterned after Aptos Youth Basketball, right? I think I was 11 years old. So this is my first warmer story that I can remember. And I think the, I think they used to line the chairs up, is that right in the middle we'd sit. So I was 11 years old, Kevin and I were probably on the same team we were playing. And so, um, you know, Coach Tanamoto and Warmer probably looked at, okay, who's, you know, who are these guys coming up and play for us? And Warmer yells at me, hey, come here, I want to talk to you. So we were sitting in the chairs, I think right here, I remember. He goes, hey, and I, you know, at that time, I coached basketball for 39 years. Warmer didn't know I was going to be a basketball coach or anything like that. He goes, hey, come here. He's got this clipboard, so I sit down next to him. I use the coach. And he goes, hey, check out our new offense for next year. And I'm like, you know, look, yeah, I'm, you know, kind of a student of the game, probably back then even. And he's got this clipboard, and he put, puts the key and draws five guys in there, and he puts his pen, this is no lie, puts his pen on the paper, and he just starts scribbling. Like this. <laughs> scribbles. Scribbles and with just a, you know, a bunch of scribble on the paper. He goes, "What do you think?" And I'm like, uh, sounds good, coach. Sounds good. Sounds good to me. Yeah, but he, he was just messing with me. I, I got it. He was like a prankster. And uh, yeah, and, and the guy was just a classic. And, and like everybody said, we just had so much fun playing for him. You know, throughout the years. And and my my last. Not my last memory, but one of the last stories. When I first uh, got the job at SoCal High as the coach, it was 30 years ago, 30, 31 years ago. And I don't think I had any kids because my wife and I were coming to the SoCal Aptos football game, walking across the upper parking lot up there when they had it. It was above the tennis court. You guys probably don't remember that. My wife and I were walking in, you know, the game's getting ready to start down there, and I hear, hey! And kind of look, and keep going. Because it took me to look around and say, hey, it's warm. I go, warm. Come here. So it's, he's in the Chinook. And he's got, he's got the ice chest in there. He's got the ice chest on top. And we jumped in the Chinook, had a cold one. But we got the ice chest in there. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget those two stories. But, you know, we just love playing for the guy. And, and he was definitely a classic. That's for sure. That's all I got. Mark, you want to come up and, and fish it? I'm going to be short and sweet. I just have a couple stories that I had to share. Um, Bill and I worked together for 30 years in a PE department. So I know him more as a PE teacher than a coach, but I was around, I was in here a lot. Um, my first memory of Bill was, you know how the coaches at the beginning of the year have to have a, a, a meeting and they teach you first aid and you have to go try out psychology and all that stuff. Well, I'm fairly new. I'm sitting in the front seat, Bill's sitting right behind me, there's all these coaches from Aptos and lots of Bill High School and everything, and they start the meeting. And the instructor starts asking questions. I go, I know the answer, and I answer the question, and they go, they go, yeah, that's right. Bill, somebody in the back, right behind me, is Bill, and he taps me on the back, I turn around, he's got that Bill grin, gives me a thumbs up. I go, wow, that's cool. And uh, so, they're going on, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped up now. So he asked another question. I, I jump up, I answer the question again. I turn around, everybody's looking at me like, wow, this guy's good. And Bill taps me on the back, and gives me another thumbs up with his big grin. And this goes on and on and on. I'm going, there's something fishy here because the instructor keeps asking questions and I'm the only one answering them. 
So what really happened was, because I turned around and everybody was looking happy for me, but it was the Bill Walmart ad show because they gave us these orange drinks and on the top of the lid there was this little sticky. So every time I answered a question, Bill would tap me on the back and I had like 12 stickies on my back by the time I was done. So that was game on. So for the next 30 years, we pulled tricks on each other every day. We laughed every day and we had a great time. It was a lot of fun. I was also the football coach at one time and uh, we had a Saturday game here and it was hot. And I had just won a bet with Bobby Salazar, and it was for a six-pack of beer. And Bobby comes down to the game, it wasn't quite halftime yet, and he says, Jim, I got, uh, I got your beer, it's on, it's nice and cold, it's on the top of your locker in the locker room. Well, it was hot, and the officials usually finish up after the game, they go up to the locker room, take a shower and stuff. So I knew the officials pretty good. Probably the last game I ever won, though. Because um, the officials, I said, hey, there's a couple cold ones on top of my locker, help yourself. So I get up there after, you know, you talk to the press and all that stuff. And I got up there and the official goes, hey, what's the big idea, Michelson? There's water in those beers. <laughs> I go, what? Well, come to find out, the bill went up there at halftime. <laughs> and you can guess the rest of the story. <laughs> so anyway, the last story I have is... Um, they notice the lights up here, the, the lights, or these are new lights, the, other, the old lights, I don't know how new they are, but the old lights used to hang down and they were round and, and they would buzz and stuff like that and sometimes they would explode and all the glass would fall down on the floor. Well, Bill had a basketball game and this light right here, it was hanging down there and it was buzzy and flashing and and, and Bill tried to get, you know, it was a couple days before the game. He goes, you know, you guys have got to change that light. Well, they told him, he said, we can't change the light until it, unless it's burned out. And, you know, they got to bring a scalpel up in here and stuff. So, so Bill went and got a bow and arrow, and he shut off the light. <laughs> and the light was fixed. <laughs> so it came game time, and I'm standing over there with the principal, and he's looking around, and pretty soon he looks up and he goes, Hey, there's an arrow up there. <laughs> I'm going, gosh darn, there is. Wonder how that got there. <laughs> and, you know, uh, those of you that knew me and knew my car, my license plate said, gosh darn. Huh? God bless you. God bless your family. Barbie, remember you on the, on the, Houseboat trip? <laughs> A long time ago. I'm sorry I got you guys mixed up. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, for letting me talk. I'm really glad that Coach Michelson came up here. He reminded me of another story before we start tonight. I'll finish off with the last story. If any of you saw the Sentinel today, there was a wonderful, wonderful article on, on Coach Warmerdam, and it shared some stories. And it shared the story of one time he was teaching driver training and he fell asleep. And they woke up in Monterey and he goes, Oh my God, turn the car around. Well, that's not the story. Coach Byron explained to me that when he got in the car, he said, Wake me up when we get to Monterey. <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank all the wonderful speakers today. Um, everyone was just wonderful and outstanding. The stories were, were tremendous. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today to celebrate Coach Warmer Dam. I'd particularly like to thank Pat and all the Warmer Dams for your presence today and, and sharing your life with our lives. Um, one piece of nuts and bolt. Um, when we break up here, we'd ask that every player and coach please Shuffle, shuffle over there. We want to take a, a team photo of all the players and coaches here today and we'll present it to the family later. So when we break up all Coach Homer's players and coaches um, over against the wall. One last time, thank you all so very much for celebrating the life of a wonderful man.